high in the forest-clad hills of the southern uplands is the source of a remarkable river. The River Neff is quiet and unassuming, and it flows through the landscape and through history almost unnoticed, notching up some remarkable firsts along the way. Scotland's rivers are the cradle of the nation and are among the country's greatest treasures. Since the earliest times, rivers have been used as natural highways. Along their banks, the first towns and cities were built. And as a natural resource, rivers have provided us with an abundance of food and power. In this series, I'll meet a cast of characters who live along the banks of our great waterways. I'll uncover intriguing tales from the past as I travel across Scotland on a grand tour to explore the original waters of life. In this program, I'll discover a river that flows through a landscape rich in literature and invention. My route starts in a rarely visited forestry plantation, tracking first east through the old Ayrshire coal fields and then turning south into a landscape celebrated by Robert Burns before reaching the sea and the Solway Firth. My journey down the Nith begins on a forestry road, high in the remote Ayrshire hills, where I hope to find the source of the river. The source of the Nith starts somewhere up here. Now on my map, you can see a huge forestry plantation, but many of the trees have been cut down. But just a few hundred metres ahead of me is where I hope to find what I'm looking for, very helpfully marked on my map as the source of the Nith. This is a tricky environment. The river actually rises in boggy ground, covered by this tangle of windblown spruce trees making pinpointing the exact source an impossible task. Instead, I'm content to find the baby river nith where it emerges from the fallen timber. Now this is pretty much as close as I can get to the source of the nith, which here is not much more than a mere trickle, but I'm gonna follow it as it grows and flows all the way to the sea. The infant river winds its way through the forest and out into a different landscape altogether, where old open-cast mine workings are being landscaped to hide the scars of coal extraction. Most of the towns and villages along the Upper Nith were involved in mining, and for generations, coal was king. Now, although it provided families with a meagre living, it could sometimes take life away. On the 7th of September 1950, just a mile from the river, disaster struck. Thirteen miners were killed and a further 116 trapped below ground when the earth above them collapsed. Seven decades after the miners were trapped by the underground subsidence, I walked to the memorial cairn above the old workings. With me is Ian McMurdo whose father was one of the survivors. Where we're standing just now was the scene of the inrush where the, the field, the cattle field, fell in to the mine workings. What, in uh, front of us? In front of us here, just over here. Uh -huh. Some of the miners, 13 uh, specifically, were working in this particular area to chase what was called the main coal seam. It was a lucrative seam of coal. They'd driven the road to within 15 yards of the surface. But a silent killer waited for the men as they worked underground. A mossy, peaty field, saturated after a week of torrential rain. The local rivers, they were all, they, they, they'd bust their banks. All this water was on top of where the miners were working. So they were oh, busy burrowing underground, yep. undermining the structure that was supporting Ab all this water. Absolutely, and they'd got to within 15 yards of the surface. And then what happened? What happened was at 7.20 on the evening of Thursday the 7th of September, the whole damn thing came in in a colossal violent rush. The men number five heading who were directly below died. 11 of them died fairly immediately, but two of them uh, that we know of had wandered off. They'd managed to get out of the heading and took 11 days before they actually perished. 
two miles away from where the 13 men died, 116 other miners were still working underground when a sea of sludge and peaty water slowly filled the tunnels. They would not know immediately that there had been an inrush because they were so far away. But word soon got to them that all their egress routes were uh, blocked off and there was no way out. They were trapped. They were trapped. They were buried alive. Local people, miners and rescue teams from around the UK rushed to Nokshinach. There was only one slim chance of rescue, to reach the men from an old mine close by, bank number six. If the men could somehow dig from the Nokshinach side through to bank with their pickaxes and bare hands, they could theoretically get through. After two days of non-stop digging, the men broke through but rising levels of deadly gas prevented their immediate escape. Desperate rescuers then deployed special breathing apparatus to bring the miners out. But all those men managed to survive, they managed to escape. The 116 men got out, and that was a miracle by any other name. We're standing here now, I mean, you would have no idea, had it not been for this memorial cairn, that there was even a mine here. No, no, but it's a long time ago, it's 70 years ago. Uh -huh. But the landscape has been utterly transformed. Yes, it has been transformed, yes. But it still has. Maybe it's just because I'm the son of one of the miners who was trapped down there, but I still think it still has an atmosphere and some kind of... I, I don't know, I just think you can feel that something... something tragic happened here. From the memorial cairn, I leave New Cumnock and its mining heritage and head downstream where the river seems to have thrown off its industrial past as it meanders through the countryside. Eventually, I reach Sankar, which was made a royal borough in 1598. Sankar might be a royal borough, but it's a very small one. Population 2001, at least it was when I last counted. Sankar means old fort and has some fine old buildings, including a ruined castle and a rather grand toll booth, reflecting the town's former wealth. There's also a record-breaking first. Sankar is home to the world's oldest working post office. The post office has been running ever since it first opened, way back in 1712, would you believe? Now, that's over 300 years. And in there, you can get the oldest postal stamp in the world. I just hope that my old ma appreciates the card I'm sending with its unique and remarkable stamp. In the past, Sankar was an important centre of business and trade, focused principally on the manufacture of textiles sourced from locally produced wool. Now, much of that heritage has been lost but with one notable exception, the Sanka knitting pattern. At the Tollbooth Museum, I meet Mae McCormick, who shows me a wonderful variety of unique Sanka knitting patterns. It's very distinctive and very striking. How many patterns are there altogether? There's 16 patterns altogether. Uh -huh. The one that is most recognised and very often referred to as the Sanka pattern is this one, which is the Duke pattern. That's the Duke pattern. And it was um, supposedly designed for the Duke of Buccleuch mm -hmm. because he was a big supporter of, of the Sankar knitting. Other patterns in May's sample include the cornet, the pheasant's eye, the shepherd's plaid, the rose and trellis, and perhaps worryingly, the midge and flea. The group of black stitches is the midge and the right. small white stitch is the flea. Right. I wonder why they called it the midge and the flea. Somebody with a sense of humour. Probably. <laughs> <laughs> you have to have a sense of humour, to be honest, wouldn't you? Now, what happened to the Sankar pattern? Because I understand it almost kind of died out as a tradition. In, in the late 1700s, it uh, went into a drastic decline. Um, for two reasons. One was the American War of Independence because the exported to the colonies, the UK exported to the colonies, and that stopped during the American War of uh -huh. Independence and the modernisation, of course. I would really love to have my own Sanka knitted pattern, and I think you're going to teach me how to go about making my own. <laughs> we'll try. <laughs> we'll try. <laughs> well, fingers crossed. Yeah.
Now me, I've got, uh, I've got my needles here. I've got three needles forming a perfect little triangle here. And you're going to teach me how to turn this into a glove. <laughs> <laughs> okay. With the right hand, you knit as you would ordinary. Unfortunately for me, I'm a poor student and the lesson is a hard one. Three needles, two colours, one in each hand. And I've got black in one hand and the white in the other, and now we just... Now, with, with just your right hand, a black stitch or that you're going to knit, you're going to knit it in white okay. and vice versa. I'm completely out of my depth and feel utterly inept under May's critical gaze. I'm going to have to, I'm going to, have to admit defeat here. <laughs> this is very embarrassing, but um, it's too complicated. I don't think there's any hope for me, really, is there? <laughs> <laughs> no comment. <laughs> Leaving Sanka without knitted gloves, I follow the nith in a southerly direction through Old Dumfrieshire to Drumlandrig Castle, home to the Duke of Buccleuch. About 160 years ago, a humble blacksmith who was also a tenant of the Duke came up with a brilliant and potentially world-beating invention. He was also known as the Devil on Wheels and is said to have produced the first proper bicycle in the world. The Devil on Wheels who made it was Kirkpatrick Macmillan. And to tell me about the man and his invention is author Ian Barr. This is the Velocipede, the Velocipede invented by Kirkpatrick Macmillan. Um, in a period 1839, 1840. And he was called the Devil on Wheels because of the, the terrible rumble the <laughs> Velocipede made going along the country lanes because of the iron trim. Now, what was the inspiration behind it? Because it looks a bit like a, an old hobby horse which has been adapted. That's exactly it. Macmillan set about trying to improve the basic hobby horse which at the time was a fashionable toy for the wealthy. It had no pedals and was pushed along with the rider's feet on the ground. Kirkpatrick Macmillan's improvement added a steerable front wheel and pedals, but significantly, no brakes. Despite these technical drawbacks, Macmillan wanted to prove his velocipede and cycled to Glasgow to demonstrate the potential of his invention. But as he entered the city, disaster struck. A young girl ran out of a tenement close and Macmillan knocked her over on the velocipede. A police officer was called and, and Macmillan spent the night in the cells in Glasgow. Was the wee girl OK? We think that, apart from a little bit of shock, that she was okay. But the fact that there's a court record means that there was an official record uh -huh. of this cycle. If there hadn't been that record, then I think Macmillan's claim to fame would have been much more right. in dispute. So it was a criminal record that got him into the, the Guinness Book of Records as the inventor of the bicycle. Absolutely. It's an important part of Scottish history. I can't resist the temptation to mount the velocipede and with Ian's guidance, I'm soon straddling Macmillan's contraption. I'm on the velocipede. How do I get it moving? Just give it a good old push forward and then just try and relax. And it's the rhythm of the treadles. Right, we're sort of hobby horse style. Yep. And see if I can adapt to these treadles. It's my left foot on. Whoa, that feels a bit weird. I've got one left. I can only get one foot on. Oh! Back and forward, back That's and one. forward. Whoa, You're doing great, well whoa, done. Whoa, whoa. Keep going. Uh, Got plenty of road ahead. OK, but I'm actually going slower than you at walking pace. I can't really steer, but we are moving. We are pedalling the velocipede, just as Patrick McMillan did all those years ago, from here to Glasgow. Ah. I'm full of admiration for Kirkpatrick Macmillan, but to be honest, I'm happy enough to get off and return to the less hazardous pursuit of walking. Help! A generation before Kirkpatrick Macmillan was born, another man of invention was walking the banks of the River Nith. Not a blacksmith with a vision, but a wordsmith with the power to conjure up vivid stories and characters from his imagination. 
About three quarters of the way to the sea, the river here was once the haunt of Robert Burns, Scotland's national bard. Burns lived here at Ellisland in a farmhouse that he helped design and build himself. Now the property overlooks the River Nith, whose gentle, constant murmurings would have formed a soundscape to his every working day. To find out what life was like for the poet, I'm meeting up with Professor Gerard Carruthers outside the home where Burns hoped to start a new life. This is where Burns comes really to grow up because it's his first marital home with Jean Armour. He has got the prospect of a gig with the excise service in Dumfrieshire, and he's also really turned on by the landscape. He thinks, I can write poems and songs here. So this is a place where Burns is going into overdrive in all aspects of his life. Burns also wanted to reinvent himself, having acquired something of a reputation in his native Ayrshire. At Ellisland, he resolved to become a better man and husband as he worked the land and drew inspiration from nature and the River Nith in particular. The sounds of the Nith, the sky, the landscape, um, the birds, the flowers, he's writing about all these things, he's in sensory overdrive, and he says the banks of Nith are the sweetest poetic ground I ever saw. This is the place where he writes Tam O'Shanter. It's also no accident that one of the other greatest hits, Old Lang Syne, is written here, which again has got river imagery in it. So a lot of the stuff that isn't explicitly about the Nith is coming out of his experience of the Nith. While Ellisland may have inspired poetry, it was a poor farm. After three hard and disappointing years, the family left and moved to Dumfries. But the legacy of his Ellisland years lives on. It's interesting that many of the songs that he writes here go on to be not only Scottish but European classics. And people still love that material today because nature, to all intents and purposes, is also as it was in Burns' day. It's amazing. And to think that it all started here in this wee house beside the River Ness. Leaving Ellisland, I follow the poet's footsteps beside the River Nith, wondering if inspiration will come to me, as it did so obviously to Burns. Now, according to literary experts who know about these things, the rhythm of the poem Tam O'Shanter is a walking rhythm and is said to mimic the pace of Robert Burns as he walked along the banks of the River Nith, composing as he went. And we can put this to the test if I can remember the words. Here we go. When Chapman billies leave the street and truthy neighbours, neighbours meet and market days are wearing late and folk begin to tack the gate. We sit boozing at the nappy, getting foo and unca happy. Didn't miss a beat. In Burns's day, the path along the River Nith, which helped to inspire drunken Tam, led from Ellisland to the grand home of his literary chum and drinking buddy, Robert Riddle, who lived in Friars Cars. As is well known, Burns, rather like Tam O'Shanter himself, was no slouch when it came to raising a glass, and he often sought distraction of an alcoholic variety with his pal Riddle. On such occasions, excess was seen as a virtue. One night, Burns was present at a party game at Friars Cars that involved three lairds drinking themselves under a table. The last man capable of blowing a whistle was the winner of the contest. This victorious laird had beaten the opposition by downing no less than eight bottles of claret. Now that's quite an achievement and one that Burns celebrated with the poem, The Whistle. When Burns wasn't fired by the River Muse, he spent a good deal of his free time hobnobbing with the local gentry. Among them, his landlord, Patrick Miller, who owned Del Swinton Estate on the left bank of the Nith. Miller, it seems, liked having a poet on his land, and he also supported other creative folk, including the mining engineer, William Symington, who notched up another first for the area. On the 14th of October, 1788, he successfully launched the world's very first paddle steamer. 
Beside the loch is a full-size replica of this world-beating vessel, a twin-hulled craft powered by a simple steam engine turning a central paddle wheel. It's a significant and forgotten inventive first for Scotland, but disappointingly, the location Symington chose to make this historic voyage suggests a lack of confidence in his invention. Rather than trusting to the open sea, the world's first paddle-propelled steamboat was cautiously launched into the very sheltered waters of Dalswinton Loch, which to me looks more like a mill pond. Six miles further downstream, I come to the biggest town in this part of the country, Dumfries and its old and very famous bridge. The bridge is named after the woman who commissioned a crossing to be built here over the River Neff. Now, her name was Lady Dervagilla, a powerful aristocrat of royal descent whose fortune established Sweetheart Abbey and Balliol College, Oxford. The original bridge dates from about 1260 and was built of wood. The present structure mostly dates from the 17th century and is one of Scotland's oldest and is still in use by pedestrians today. Overlooking the bridge is an old windmill tower that was turned into an observatory in the 1830s. It's now a museum where I'm meeting Joanne Mackay to learn about a local lad, Robert Wayland. Without Robert's work in astronomy during the 1960s, Neil Armstrong might never have walked on the moon. It's the most, it's a story that almost beggars belief. At the age of 15, he makes his first telescope to capture a good image of Mars. From there, he builds um, an observatory, a fully functioning observatory in his back garden. In and Dumfries. In, in, Dum in, yeah. in, in Glen Capel, just outside of Dumfries. An absolutely stunning achievement. And not only is he grinding the lenses, every single part is made and machined by him. Robert Whelan's youthful genius soon got him noticed and he was headhunted by the acclaimed astronomer Professor Freundlich at St Andrews University to help build a new telescope. Then, in 1961, President Kennedy made an important speech. It would change the course of Robert's life. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the Earth. To choose a suitable place for a lunar landing, NASA needed as much information about the surface of the moon as possible. All of a sudden, lunar astronomy becomes very, very important. There is one man who is doing this work, and that is Professor Kuiper. Professor Kuiper at the University of Arizona then starts the first lunar and planetary laboratory, and uh, Mr. Wayland actually goes to the University of Arizona, produces the Kuiper telescope, and it is this telescope which captures the image used in Kuiper's famous consolidated lunar atlas. The astonishingly detailed images captured by Whelan's optics are breathtaking. This is an actual plate of the Sea of Tranquility, wow. where they actually landed. And the telescope um, did a phenomenal job. You can see the quality of the resolution. Mm. And that's where the eagle landed. That is where the <laughs> eagle wouldn't you love to be the one that said that? <laughs> the eagle has landed. It's amazing, though, isn't it, to think that a man from Dumfries helped Neil Armstrong navigate his way around the lunar surface. It is absolutely phenomenal. Without the aid of any kind of atlas, I navigate my way back to the river, where I return to the trail of Robert Burns. After Ellis Land, he and his family moved into Dumfries, and there are reminders of him everywhere. Robert Burns wasn't much of a family man, really, preferring instead the company of other good fellows at a hostelry known then and now as The Globe. Inside one of the oldest public houses in Scotland, I meet up with Jane Brown for an insight into the intimate social life of Robert Burns. This is what they called his house. And how in old Scots means favourite haunt. So this is where he would come. Haunt. His favourite haunt, right. where he would come for a wee dram or 
a wee glass of claret or whatever and a bit of chat. So this would have been quite a busy wee pub, I guess. Absolutely, yes. It was the hub of the town and a very, very popular, a vibrant pub, I would say. Uh -huh. Burns delighted in the lively social mix at the Globe, so much so that he sometimes gave into temptation and failed to make it home to his wife, Jean Armour. And it was in this bedroom that he slept with a young serving girl. They had an affair with the landlord's niece, Anna Park, and she gave birth to a baby girl nine days before his wife, Jean, gave birth to a son. Unfortunately, Anna died at some point and the child, Elizabeth Burns, was brought back and Jean Armour brought the child up with her own children. What an amazing thing for Jean Armour to do, to take very, on very Burns' illegitimate child and try and find space and time emotionally and physically to bring that child up within her own family. Yes, and stay in love with Burns. But he wrote a poem to Anna. Yes, Trina had a pint of wine, a place where body saw na. Yes, Trina lay on this breast of mine, the gowden locks of Anna. Burns's genius with sentimental verse masks the grim reality of Anna's tragic death. But the verse wasn't the only poem inspired by love in the room. Burns etched other lines into the window panes. We still have two original etchings, which is really, really special. And one is here, in this inner frame, O lovely Polly Stewart, O charming Polly Stewart. There's no a fleur that blooms in me that's half so fair as thou art. Did he write that before or after his Oh, well, I'm not sure. Hope Anna. it was after, Anna. <laughs> I mean, if Anna had seen that, she would have been a bit hacked off, I'm guessing. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Leaving the globe, I head back to the River Nith. As it widens to meet the Solway Firth, it becomes a place of vast, glistening tidal flats and big skies. Here, the fresh water of the river, which rose in the hills of East Ayrshire, mixes with salt water in a wide, shallow estuary. Standing guard at the mouth of the river is Calaverock Castle, the fort of the Lark. You know, Calaverock is everything that a castle should be. It's got mighty walls, battlements, and towers at every corner, and there's even a moat. It's the very quintessence of a castle. The present castle dates from the 13th century and was built by the mighty Maxwell family who held sway here for 400 years. Because Calaverock commands access to one of the principal routes into Scotland, it was besieged by Edward I of England. In 1300, he came with an army of 3,000 men, but the strength of the castle's defences allowed the 60 Scots inside to repel several assaults until they were eventually forced to surrender. Since then, the castle's been knocked about a good bit, but enough survives to fire the imagination, making Calaverock an ideal place for me to end my grand tour down the River Nith. The river of invention. Join me on my next grand tour when I go with the flow down the River South Esk.